She had to devote her life to begging and bullying her army into playing with her so that she could keep all the money they made for her family, while their families went hungry and their mothers demanded that they come home straight from school. When Mr. Banerjee mentioned his gigantic sum, it had conjured up a vision of untold wealth, a real house, lovely clothes for all of them. Mamaji free to spend her afternoons cooking for the family and resting out of the heat, a life away from Dharavi and the smoke and the stinging eyes and sore throats. I think your little girl is right, Mr. Banerjee said, with quiet authority, and Mullah's entire family stared at him, speechless. An adult, taking Mullah's side over her mother. She is a very good leader, from what I can see. If she says her people need paying. I believe that she is correct. He wiped at his mouth with a handkerchief. With all due respect, of course. I wouldn't dream of telling you how to raise your children, of course. Of course, Mamaji said. As if in a dream. Her eyes were downcast, her shoulders slumped. To be spoken to this way, in her own home, by a stranger, in front of her children. Mala felt terrible. Her poor mother. And it was all Mr. Banerjee's fault. He'd mentioned the money in front of her army, and then he'd brought her mother to this point. I will find a way to get them to fight without payment. Mamaji. Dash quote. But she was cut short by her mother's hand, coming up, palm out to her. Quiet, daughter, she said. If this man, this gentleman, says you know what you're doing, well, then I can't contradict him, can I? I'm just a simple woman from the village. I don't understand these things. You must do what this gentleman says, of course. Mr. Banerjee stood and smoothed his suit back into place with the palms of his hands. Mala saw that he'd gotten some chana on his shirt and lapel, and that made her feel better somehow, like he was a mortal and not some terrible force of nature who'd come to destroy their little lives. He made a little namaste at Mamaji, hands pressed together at his chest, a small hint of a bow. Good night, Mrs. Vajpayee. That was a lovely supper. Thank you, he said. Good night, General Robotwala. I will come to the cafe tomorrow at three o'clock to talk more about your missions. Good night, Gopal, he said, and her brother looked up at him, guiltily, eggplant still poking out of the corner of his mouth. Mala thought that Mamaji might slap her once the man had left, but they all went to bed together without another word, and Mala snuggled up to her mother the same as she did every night, stroking her long hair. It had been shining and black when they left the village, but a year later, it was shot through with grey and it felt wiry. Mamaji's hand caught hers and stilled it the calluses on her fingers rough. Sleep, daughter, she murmured. You have an important job. Now. You need your sleep. The next morning, they avoided one another's eyes, and things were hard for a week, until she brought home her first pay packet, folded carefully in the sole of her shoe. Her army had carved through the enemy forces like the butcher's cleaver parting heads from chickens. There had been a large bonus in their pay packet, and even after she'd paid Mrs. Daibayendu and bought everyone masala coke at the hotel hajj next door, and paid the army their wages. There was almost 2.000 rupees left, and she took Mamaji into the smallest sorting room in the loft of the factory, up the ladder. Mamaji's eyes lit up when she saw the money, and she'd kissed Mala on the forehead and taken her in the longest, fiercest hug of their lives together. And now it was all wonderful between them. Mamaji had begun to look for a place for them further towards the middle of Dharavi, the old part where the tin and scrap buildings had been gradually replaced with brick ones, where the potter's kilns smoked a clean wood smoke instead of the dirty, scratchy plastic smoke near Mr. Kunal's factory. Mala had new school clothes, new shoes, and so did Gopal, and Mamaji had new brushes for her hair and a new sari that she wore after her workday was through, looking pretty and young, the way Mala remembered her from the village. And the battles were glorious. She entered the cafe out of the melting, dusty sun of late day and stood in the doorway. Her army was already assembled. Practicing on their machines. Passing gupshup in the shadows of the dark, noisy room, or making wet eyes at one another through the dim. She barely had time to grin and then hide the grin before they noticed her and climbed to their feet, standing straight and proud, saluting her. She didn't know which one of them had begun the saluting business. It had started as a joke, but now it was serious. They vibrated at attention. All eyes on her. They had on better clothes, they looked well fed. General Robotwala was leading her army to victory and prosperity. Let's play. She said. In her pocket, her handphone had the latest message from Mr. Banerjee with the location of the day's target. 
Yasmin was at her usual place, at Mala's right hand, and at her left sat Fulmala, who had a bad limp from a leg that she'd broken and that hadn't healed right. But Fulmala was smart and fast, and she grasped the tactics better than anyone in the café except Mala herself. And Yasmin, well. Yasmin could make the boys behave, which was a major accomplishment, since left to their own they liked to squabble and one-up each other, in a reckless spiral that always ended badly. But Yasmin could talk to them in a way that was stern like an older sister, and they'd fall into line. Mala had her army, her lieutenants, and her mission. She had her machine, the fastest one in the café, with a bigger monitor than any of the others, and she was ready to go to war. She touched up her displays, rolled her head from side to side, and led her army to battle again. Hash. This scene is dedicated to Barnes & Noble, a U.S. national chain of bookstores. As America's mom and pop bookstores were vanishing, Barnes & Noble started to build these gigantic temples to reading all across the land. Stocking tens of thousands of titles the mall bookstores and grocery store spinner racks had stocked a small fraction of that and keeping long hours that were convenient to families, working people and others potential readers, the B&N stores kept the careers of many writers afloat, stocking titles that smaller stores couldn't possibly afford to keep on their limited shelves. B&N has always had strong community outreach programs, and I've done some of my best attended, best organized signings at B&N stores, including the great events at the sadly departed B&N in Union Square, New York, where the mega signing after the Nebula Awards took place, and the B&N in Chicago that hosted the event after the Nebs a few years later. Best of all is that B&N's geeky buyers really get it when it comes to science fiction, comics and manga, games and similar titles. They're passionate and knowledgeable about the field and it shows in the excellent selection on display at the stores. Barnes & Noble, nationwide. Gold. It's all about gold. But not regular gold, the sort of thing you dig out of the ground. That stuff was for the last century. There's not enough of it, for one thing, all the gold ever dug out of the ground in the history of the world would only amount to a cube whose sides were the length of a tennis court. And curiously, there's also too much of it. All the certificates of gold ownership issued into the world add up to a cube twice that size. Some of those certificates don't amount to anything, and no one knows which ones. No one has independently audited Fort Knox since 1956 FCK. For all we know, it's empty, the gold smuggled out and sold, put in a vault, sold as certificates, then stolen again and put into another vault, used as the basis for more certificates. Not regular gold. Virtual gold. Call it what you want, in one game it's called credits, in another. Volcano bucks, there are groats. Disney dollars, cowries, moolah, and fool's gold, and a million other kinds of gold out there. Unlike real gold. There's no vault of reserves backing the certificates. Unlike money, there's no government involved in their issue. Virtual gold is issued by companies. Game companies. Game companies who declare. So many gold pieces can buy this piece of armor, or so many credits can buy this spaceship, or so much jewels can buy this zeppelin. And because they say it, it is true. Countries and their banks have to mess around with the ugly business of convincing citizens to believe what they say, the government may say. This social security check will provide for all your needs in a month, but that doesn't mean that the merchants who supply those needs will agree. Companies don't have this problem. When Coca-Cola says that 76 groats will buy you one dwarvish axe in Svartafaheim Warriors, that's it, the price of an axe is 76 groats. Don't like it. Go play somewhere else. Virtual money isn't backed by gold or governments. It's backed by fun. So long as a game is fun, players somewhere will want to buy into it, because as fun as the game is. It's always more fun if you're one of the haves, with all the awesome armor and killer weapons, than if you're some lowly noob have not with a dagger, fighting your way up to your first sword. But where there's money to be spent. There's money to be made. For some players, the most fun game of all is the game that carves them out a slice of the pie. Not all the action belongs to the giant companies up on their tall offices and the games they make. Plenty of us can get in on the action from down below, where the grubby little people are. Of course. This makes the companies bonkers. They're big daddy, they know what's best for their worlds. They are in control. They design the levels and the difficulty to make it all perfectly balanced. They design the puzzles. 
They decree that light elves can't talk to dark elves, that players on Russian servers can't hop onto the Chinese servers, that it would take the average player 32 hours to attain the von Clausewitz drive and 48 hours to earn the Order of the Armored Penguin. If you don't like it, you're supposed to leave. You're not supposed to just buy your way out of it. Or if you do, you should have the decency to buy it from them. And here's a little something they won't tell you, these gods of the virtual, they can't control it. Kids, crooks, and weirdos all over the world have riddled their safe little terrarium worlds with tunnels leading to the great outdoors. There are multiple, competing interworld exchanges, want to swap out your zombie mecha wealth for a fully loaded spaceship and a crew of jolly space pirates to crew it. Ten different gangs want your business, they'll fix you right up with someone else's spaceship and take your mecha, arms and ammo into inventory for the next person who wants to immigrate to zombie mecha from some other magical world. And the gods are powerless to stop it. For every barrier they put up. There are hundreds of smart, motivated players of the big game who will knock it down. You'd think it'd be impossible. Wouldn't you? After all, these aren't mere games of cops and robbers, played out in real cities filled with real people. They don't need an all-points bulletin to find a fugitive at large. Every person in the world is in the database, and they own the database. They don't need a search warrant to find the contraband hiding under your floorboards, the floorboards, the contraband, the house and you are all in the database, and they own the database. It should be impossible, but it isn't, and here's why, the biggest sellers of gold and treasure, levels and experience in the worlds are the game companies themselves. Oh, they don't call it power leveling and gold farming, they package it with prettier, more palatable names, like Accelerated Progress Bonus Pack and All Together Now TM and lots of other redonkulous names that don't fool anyone. But the gods aren't happy with merely turning a buck on players who are too lazy to work their way up through the game. They've got a much, much weirder game in play. They sell gold to people who don't even play the game. That's right, if you're a big shot finance guy and you're looking for somewhere to stash a million bucks where it will do some good, you can buy a million dollars worth of virtual gold, hang onto it as the game grows and becomes more and more fun, as the value of the gold rises and rises, and then you can sell it back for real money through the official in-game banks, pocketing a chunky profit for your trouble. So while you're piloting your mecha, swinging your axe or commanding your space fleet, there's a group of weird old grown-ups in suits in fancy offices all over the world watching your play eagerly. Trying to figure out if the value of in-game gold is going to go up or down. When a game starts to suck, everyone rushes to sell out their holdings, getting rid of the gold as fast as they can before its value it obliterated by board gamers switching to a competing service. And when the game gets more fun, well. That's an even bigger frenzy, as the bidding wars kick up to high gear, every banker in the world trying to buy the same gold for the same world. Is it any wonder that 8 of the 20 largest economies in the world are in virtual countries? And is it any wonder that playing has become such a serious business? Hash. This scene is dedicated to Secret Headquarters in Los Angeles, my drop-dead all-time favorite comic store in the world. It's small and selective about what it stocks, and every time I walk in, I walk out with three or four collections I'd never heard of under my arm. It's like the owners, Dave and David, have the uncanny ability to predict exactly what I'm looking for, and they lay it out for me seconds before I walk into the store. I discovered about three quarters of my favorite comics by wandering into SHQ, grabbing something interesting, sinking into one of the comfy chairs, and finding myself transported to another world. When my second story collection, Overclocked, came out, they worked with local illustrator Martin Senreda to do a free mini-comic based on print crime, the first story in the book. I left LA about a year ago, and of all the things I miss about it, Secret Headquarters is right at the top of the list. Secret Headquarters. 3817 West Sunset Boulevard. Los Angeles. California, 90026 plus 1 323 666 2228. Matthew stood outside the door of the Internet Cafe, breathing deeply. On the walk over, he'd managed to calm down a little, but as he drew closer, he became more and more convinced that Boss Wing's boys would be waiting for him there, and all his friends would be curled up on the ground. Beaten unconscious. He'd brought four of the best players with him out of Boss Wing's factory, and he knew that Boss Wing wasn't happy about that at all. He was hyperventilating, his head swimming. 
He still hurt. It felt like he had a soccer ball-sized red sun of pain burning in his underwear and one of the things he wanted most and least to do was to find a private spot to have a look in there. There was a bathroom in the cafe, so that was that, it was time to go inside. He walked up the four flights of stairs painfully, passing under the gigantic murals from GameSpace, avoiding the plastic plants on each landing that reeked of piss from players who didn't want to wait for the bathroom. From the third floor up, he was enveloped in the familiar cloud of body odor, cigarette smoke and cursing that told him he was on his way to his true home. In the doorway, he paused and peered around, looking for any sign of Boss Wing's goons, but it was business as usual, rows and rows of tables with PCs on them, a few couples sharing machines, but mostly, it was boys playing, skinny, with their shirts rolled up over their bellies to catch any breeze that might happen through the room. There were no breezes. Just the eddies in the smoke caused by the growl of all those PC fans whining as they sucked particulate-laden smoky air over the superheated motherboards and monster video cards. He slunk past the sign in desk, staffed tonight by a new kid, someone else just arrived from the provinces to find his fortune here in bad old Shenzhen. Matthew wanted to grab the kid and carry him to the city limits, explaining all the way that there was no fortune to be found here anymore, it all belonged to men like Boss Wing. Go home, he thought at the boy. Go home, this place is done. His boys were playing at their usual table. They had made a pyramid from alternating layers of double happiness cigarette packs and empty coffee cups. They looked up as he neared them, smiling and laughing at some joke. Then they saw the look on his face and they fell silent. He sat down at a vacant chair and stared at their screens. They'd been playing, of course. They were always playing. When they worked in Boss Wing's factory, they'd pull an 18-hour shift and then they'd relax by playing some more, running their own characters through the dungeons they'd been farming all day long. It's why Boss Wing had such an easy time recruiting for his factory. The pitch was seductive. Get paid to play. But it wasn't the same when you worked for someone else. He tried to find the words to start and couldn't. Matthew. It was Yo, the oldest of them. Yo actually had a family, a wife and a young daughter. He'd left Boss Wing's factory and followed Matthew. Matthew stared at his hands. Took a deep breath, and made a decision. Sorry. I just had a little fight on the way over here. I've got good news, though. I've got a way to make us all very rich in a very short time, and, from memory. Master Fong described the way he'd found into the rich dungeon of Svartafaheim warriors. He commandeered a computer and showed them, showed them how to shave the seconds off the run, where to make sure to stop and grab and pick up. And then they each took up a machine and went to work. In time, the ache in his pants faded. Someone gave him a cigarette. Then another. Someone brought him some dumplings. Master Fong ate them without tasting them. He and his team were at work, and they were making money, and someday soon. They'd have a fortune that would make Boss Wing look like a small timer. Sometime during the shift, his phone rang. It was his mother. She wanted to wish him a happy birthday. He had just turned 17. Hash. This scene is dedicated to Powell's Books, the legendary City of Books in Portland, Oregon. Powell's is the largest bookstore in the world, an endless, multi-story universe of papery smells and towering shelves. They stock new and used books on the same shelves, something I've always loved, and every time I've stopped in. They've had a veritable mountain of my books, and they've been incredibly gracious about asking me to sign the store stock. The clerks are friendly, the stock is fabulous, and there's even a Powell's at the Portland airport, making it just about the best airport bookstore in the world for my money. Powell's Books. 1005 W. Burnside. Portland. Oregon, 97209 USA plus 1-800-878-7323. Wei Dong's game suspension lasted all of 20 minutes. That's how long it took him to fake a migraine, get a study pass, sneak into the resource center, beat the network filter and log on. It was getting very late back in China, but that was okay, the boys stayed up late when they were working, and they were glad to have him. Wei Dong's real name wasn't Wei Dong, of course. His real name was Leonard Goldberg. He'd chosen Wei Dong after looking up the meanings of Chinese names and coming up with Strength of the East, which he liked the sound of. This system for picking names worked well for the Chinese kids he knew, when their parents immigrated to the States, they'd just pick some English name and that was it. Why not? 
Why was it better to pick a name because your grandfather had it than because you liked the sound of it? He'd tried to explain this to his parents, but it didn't make much of an impression on them. They were cool with him being interested in other cultures, but that didn't mean he could get out of having a bar mitzvah or that they would call him Wei Dong. And it didn't mean that they approved of him being up all night with his buds in China, making money. Wei Dong knew that this could all be seen as very lame, an outcast kid so desperate to make friends that he abandoned his high school altogether and sucked up to someone in another hemisphere with free labor instead. But it wasn't like that. Wei Dong had plenty of friends at Ronald Reagan Secondary School. Plenty of kids thought that China was the most interesting place in the world, loved the movies and the food and the comics and the games. And there were lots of Chinese kids in school too and while a couple clearly thought he was weird, lots more got it. After all, most of them were into India the way he was into China, so they had that in common. And so what if he was skipping a class? It was social studies, for Christ's sakes. They were supposed to be studying China, but Wei Dong knew about ten times more about the subject than the teacher did. As he whispered in Mandarin into his earwig, he thought that this was like an independent study project. His teachers should be giving him bonus marks. Now what, he said. What's the mission? We were thinking of running the walrus's garden a few more times. Now that we've got it fresh in our heads. Maybe we could pick up another vorpal blade. That's what the guys did when there weren't any paying guilos, they went raiding for prestige items. It wasn't the most exciting thing of all, but you never knew what might happen. I'm into it, he said. He had a free period after this one, then lunch, so technically he could play for three hours solid. They'd all be ready to log off and go to bed by then, anyway. You're a good guilo, you know, Wei Dong knew Ping was kidding. He didn't care if the guys called him guilo. It wasn't a racist term. Not really. Not like, chink, or, slant eye, just a term of affection. And as nicknames went, foreign ghost, was actually kind of cool. So they hit the garden and ran it and they did pretty well, and they went and put the money in the guild bank and went back for more. Then they did it again. Somewhere in there, the bell rang. Somewhere in there, some of his friends came and talked to him and he muted the earwig and said some things back to them, but he didn't really know what he'd said. Something. Then, on the third run, the bad thing happened. They were almost to the shore, and they'd banished their mounts. Wei Dong was prepping the queen's air pocket, dipping into the monster supply of oyster shells he'd built up on the previous runs. And out they came, a dozen knights on huge, fearsome black steeds, rising out of the water in unison, rending the air with the angry chorus of their mounts and their battle cries. The water fountained up around them and they fell upon Wei Dong and his guildies. He shouted something into his earwig, a warning, and all around him in the resource center. Kids looked up from their conversations to stare at him. He'd become a dervish, hammering away at his keyboard and mousing furiously, his eyes fixed on the screen. The black riders moved with eerie synchrony. Either they were monsters, monsters such as Wei Dong had never encountered, or they were the most practiced, cooperative raiding party he'd ever seen. He had his vorpal blade out now, and his guildies were all fighting as well. In his earwig, they cursed in the Chinese dialects of six different provinces. Under other circumstances, Wei Dong would have taken notes, but now he was fighting for his life. Lu had bravely taken the point between the riders and the party. The huge tank standing fast with his mace and broadsword, engaging all twelve of the knights without regard for his own safety. Wei Dong poured healing spells on him as he attempted to make his own mark on the riders with the vorpal blade, three times as long as he was. The vorpal blade could do incredible damage, but it wasn't easy to use. Twice. Wei Dong accidentally sliced into members of his own party, though not badly, thank God, or he'd never hear the end of it, but he couldn't get a cut in on the Black Knights, who were too fast for him. Then Lu fell, going down on one knee, pierced through the throat by a pike wielded by a rider whose steed's eyes were the icy blue of the caterpillar's mist. The rider lifted Lu into the air, his feet kicking limply. And another knight beheaded him with a contemptuous swing of his sword. Lu fell in two pieces to the gritty beach sand and in the earwig, he cursed them, using an expression that Wei Dong had painstakingly translated into, screw eight generations of your ancestors. With Lu down, the rest of them were practically helpless. 
They fought valiantly, coordinating their attacks, pouring on fire from their magic items and best spells, but the Black Knights were unbeatable. Before he died, Wei Dong managed to hit one with the Vorpal Blade and had the momentary satisfaction of watching the knight stagger and clutch at his chest, but then the fighter closed with him, drawing a pair of short swords that he spun like a magician doing knife tricks. There was no question of parrying him, and seconds later, Wei Dong was in the sand, watching the knight's spiked boot descend on his face, hearing the crunch of his cheekbones and nose shattering under the weight. Then he was respawning in the distant lake of tears, naked and unarmed, and he had to corpse run to the body of his tune before the bastards got his vorpal blade. He heard his guildies dying in the earwig, one after another, as he ran, ghostly and ethereal, across the hills and dales of Wonderland. He reached his corpse just in time to watch the knights loot the body, and the bodies of his teammates. He rose up again, helpless and unarmed and made flesh by the body of his tune, vulnerable. One of the knights sent him a chat request. He clicked it, silencing the background noises from Shenzhen. You farmers aren't welcome here anymore. Comrade, the voice said. It had an accent he didn't recognize. Maybe Russian. And the speaker was just a kid. We're patrolling now. You come back again. We'll hunt and kill you again, and again, and again. You understand me. Chinese, not just a kid, a girl, a little girl, threatening him from somewhere in the world. Who put you in charge, Missy, he said. And what makes you think I'm Chinese, anyway? There was a nasty laugh. Missy, ha. Huh. I'm in charge because I just kicked your ass, and because I can kick it again, as many times as I need to. And I don't care if you're in China. Vietnam. Indonesia, it doesn't make a difference. We'll kill you and all the farmers in Wonderland. This game isn't farmable anymore. I'm done talking to you now and the Black Knight decapitated him with contemptuous ease. He flipped back to the Guild Channel, ready to tell them about what had just happened, his mind reeling, and that's when he looked up into the face of his father, standing over him, with a look on his face that could curdle milk. Get up. Leonard, he said. And come with me. He wasn't alone. There was Mr. Adams, the vice principal, and the school's rent-a-cop. Officer Turner, and the guidance counselor. Ms. Ramirez. They presented him with the stony faces of Mount Rushmore, faces without a hint of mercy. His father reached over and took the earwig out of his ear, gently, carefully. Then, with exactly the same care, he dropped the earwig to the polished concrete floor of the resource center and brought his heel down on it, the crunch loud in the perfectly silent room. Leonard stood up. The room was full of kids pretending not to look at him. They were all looking at him. He followed his father into the hallway and as the door swung shut, he heard, unmistakably, the sound of a hundred giggles in unison. They boxed him in on the walk to the vice principal's office. Trapping him. Not that he'd run, he had nowhere to run to, but it still made him feel claustrophobic. This was not good. This was very, very bad. Here's how bad it was. You're going to send me to military school. Not military school, Ms. Ramirez said. She said it with that maddening. Patronizing guidance counselor tone. The Martindale Academy has no military or martial component. It's merely a very structured, supervised environment. They have a fantastic track record in helping students like you concentrate on grades and pull themselves out of academic troubles. They've got a beautiful campus in a beautiful location, and Martindale boys go on to fill many important. Dash quote dot. And on and on. She'd swallowed the sales brochure like a burrito and now it was rebounding on her. He tuned her out and looked at his father. Benny Rosenbaum wasn't the sort of person you could read easily. The people who worked for him at Rosenbaum Shipping and Logistics called him the wall, because you couldn't get anything past him, under him, through him, or over him. Not that he was a hard case, but he couldn't be swayed by emotional arguments, if you tried to approach him with anything less than fully computerized logic, you might as well forget it. But there were little tells, little ways you could figure out what the weather was like in old Benny. That thing he was doing with his watch strap, working at the catch, that was one of them.